All right. So I'm Jeremy Mack. Um, I came down here from Dayton. It's nice to meet all of you. Uh, you guys have a lot bigger user groups down here than we do up in Dayton, which is a good thing, because normally it's very small. But we're growing. Um, I work for Sparkbox uh, in Dayton. It's a cool web development company, downtown Dayton, Oregon district kind of area if you've ever been up there. Um, it's like one of the only places in Dayton you can work and walk to get food, which is kind of nice because that's kind of a rare thing. Um, today's talk is not going to be technical. Um, I'm going to kind of go maybe a little bit of it here and there, but I gave a talk about five, six months ago about Ember, um, and it was very technical, and it was written um, in Ember, and I presented it and kind of uh, showed live code samples during it, and you know it was all kind of crazy and difficult to grasp in an hour all the complexities of Ember. So instead, I'm going to talk about my journey from being befuddled by Ember to hating it a lot, to really hating it a lot, to starting to love it, and then kind of you know from there to the where we are now. I've heard some of you guys out here in the crowd have already started to hate it, so you're right at the right point to hear something good about it. Um, and that's the, that's the moment where it starts to get cool is when you start to really hate it. Um, so first, let's start with a survey. Um, I heard some people, um, raise your hand if you've used Backbone before. Cool. All right, that should free up some seats. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. Um, so. Backbone's actually why I learned Ember.js. Uh, it's kind of, I, I, let's back up a little bit here. Back in, let's see, probably March, May, somewhere in that time frame, one of the M months um, of 2012, I started writing like a big personal like app that I was going to release that was going to solve a problem for a podcasting network. And about three months in, you know, I had a huge Backbone app that was awesome. And you know, it worked great, except when I wanted to add new features to it. And then it was really horrible. Um, there was a lot of code copying. I got really into snippets, because you kind of need those when you're working with Backbone, because you're repeating a lot of the same things. Unless you use one of the big frameworks that's out there for Backbone. And that's kind of where I started. Um, it is a great way to start, though, because I would say learning Ember right off the bat is a terrible idea if you've never done any client-side MVC. I'd say Backbone's a wonderful way to start because you'll learn the core concepts of not using you know, your own renderers, your own callbacks, things like that. You'll instead kind of learn how to let the framework take care of some of the plumbing for you. But Backbone only takes care of some of it. Ember takes care of even more of it. And that's kind of the way I view the two. But there's still a lot to be said about the differences between the two, as I heard they had a whole day comparing them out in San Francisco. So this talk is called How I Learned Ember. Um, and it's my, kind of like I said, the answer to my incredibly technical talk about Ember that you know, was interesting to me, but probably to everybody else in the audience, I was like, you know, and this is a controller, and this is a model, and this is a controller, and this is how these two interact. And it just got crazy really fast. And the type is really small. So I've spent the last nine months writing Ember apps. I've written like six or seven like large Ember apps. Um, I've worked for a client in the evenings. I've done one for Sparkbox. Uh, and I've done a couple presentations written in Ember. So I've been all over the board and um, in the process given birth to a knowledge baby, um, which is that I kind of know a lot about the weirdnesses in Ember. And that's not a common thing. So. Uh, I'm going to give you some of that knowledge today, hopefully. <laughs> um, so here's the timeline of events. Um, and just as a side note, at the end, you guys can ask me all sorts of questions about, like, you know, how is this different than Backbone in this way, or Angular in this way? And if you say Angular, I'll just be like, I don't know, transclusion, you know, and hopefully a couple people will smile. Um, so hold your questions till the end, and feel free to go crazy. So we'll start. Um, August 1984, I'm born. No, we're not going to do that detail of a timeline. We're going to start in May 2012. So in May, I skimmed the Ember Docs. Um, that's a really small screenshot of the Ember Docs from the Wayback Archive. And back then, if you read those Ember Docs, you probably had the same reaction I did, which was these are kind of strange sounding. I've never heard these words used in JavaScript before. And you know, you'd only even heard some of them if you'd done you know, UI kit on the iPhone or iPad. So it was really kind of strange reading. And that scared me right back into Backbone, because I was like, there's no way in heck I'm going to learn all this stuff. And it sounds unnecessary. 
So then fast forward to August, and I'd written a large backbone app, and I was looking for something to do a new app. And I went back and read the Ember stuff, and I was like, this is great. Uh, this is going to solve all of my problems from before. Data binding sounds awesome. All these free things. So first week, start up with Ember, download the source, get going. And it wasn't a good time. Um, lots of bugs. This was Ember 0.9.8.1, somewhere in the early days there before they redone the router and done all those things, so I kind of wanted to kill myself. Um, so um, why was it so difficult? Uh, so it was the router 1.0, which had nesting out to infinity, even if you were using CoffeeScript, it was still pretty horrible. Um, Trek is this really awesome guy who works at Groupon, and he's one of the core team members of the Ember group now, and he does the documentation, and that's like the thing he does. He almost, you know, he wishes he could do more code, but Ember is such a large thing that needs to be well documented. You know, he's full time on that. So that was right about when he was starting doing lots of documentation. And then there were like no open source apps that were written with Ember of any size to help you learn anything. And to me, that's one of the best ways to learn is to, you know, go take open source code and learn from it. Um, yeah. So second week, I finally got the naming conventions. That's probably the biggest thing that's hard to learn about Ember. It's gotten a lot better now because there's some guides out there that will show you ex explicitly how the naming conventions um, work in Ember. That wasn't something back then, and so I was just wondering why, like this URL fragment, ha you know, I had it colon ID, this should be working. Instead, you have to have the model prefixed with an underscore. Things like that can spend you, you know, hours and hours of time trying to figure things out. Just like Rails. I mean, I would say that's one of the harder things to learn in Rails up front is where all the magic comes from. And there are a lot of parallels between Rails and Ember in the, their way of doing things and that the way that the adoption curve is kind of going where people are like, I don't understand, and then some people are like, this is awesome. You know, hopefully that kind of continues the same trend as Rails. Next up is outlets. Um, so outlets in Ember are just like yield in like Rails. Well, not just like, but they're very similar. And they're a strange concept to grasp at first because you've got this kind of magical tag you put in your handlebars and you don't really know what's going to go in there and sometimes different things can go into those outlets. That was a weird thing to kind of learn. And then associations, that was specifically to Ember Data. Um, I'll mention Ember Data later, but Ember Data has a lot less documentation than Ember itself. Um, and for those of you who don't even know Ember in general, Ember Data is another project kind of run in tandem with Ember and it's the how we get data from the server into the app. But it's probably the most ambitious library for communicating with a backend API that's been written for JavaScript. They're trying to solve the full problem of, I mean, from polymorphic associations to differently named key structures for your JSON to embedding associations or not. They're trying to solve all of that. And so th there's a lot of learning and a lot of change happening there. I mean, one of the weird ones is like, how do you determine when to mark a child or an association as dirty in the um, when you're on your client versus to mark the uh, original thing? It's kind of it's a difficult thing to figure out how to what things get dirty and what things get sent back to the server. So it's harder than it sounds to make an adapter that just talks to a server. Um, controllers, I kind of got them. I thought I really understood them. I was like, oh, you just ignore them. And they talk to the models directly. Good to go. You know, it was, it was, it was easy and until I realized someday I wanted to have some more stuff with controllers, you know, where you could store some ephemeral data, things like that. So fast forward a couple months to October. Um, so I really got the power of computed properties. This is one of the best things, I think, in Ember in general. Computed properties are just, all it is is a function that returns a value and you mark the dependent keys in that same object that it relies on to compute that value. Then all of a sudden transparently you've got a string name that you can treat as a value no matter what anywhere in your app and it's transparently cached and it only gets invalidated when those original keys get changed. And when you build your apps with computed properties, I mean, things just get really awesome. You know, you're able to pass values around and you don't have to think about whether or not this is a computed thing. Oh, you know, one, like the header for this page needs to be based on all the ch children from one of this, this association. Well, we'll iterate through all those and look for the thing. It's, it's a really great, great way to program. It's got its roots all the way back in, I don't know, probably, it's an old programming language, Fortran. Um, and no, no, it doesn't. Uh, but, it is the uniform access principle. If you want to Google it and look it up on Wikipedia, it's just a concept in programming that's really great to have. And usually that's difficult because there's no transparent getters and setters in JavaScript until ECMAScript 6. 
Um, not fighting the router anymore. That was a huge one in early days of Ember. Um, that was very painful. It would be, there, would, there would be a situation where you start up on the main page, you navigate to a second page, and the parent model hadn't quite finished loading, and so the second page would then have a undefined in the URL, and you'd have this whole problem where it was like you know the chicken and the egg, which came first. How do you get the associations to load in the correct order so I can land on this final page and actually have my data? That turned out I had to learn how to use promises, and that's a huge part of Ember nowadays, and also the new router kind of you know, gets rid of all of the problems I was having back then. But that's what I was experiencing the most pain with. Um, custom handlebars helpers are awesome. Um, how many of you guys have used mustache or handlebars? How many like must mustache and handlebars? I mean, like as a templating language. So they're kind of meant to be logicless templating languages. Um, although handlebars goes more into the logic side of things, but you're not, you're never truly embedding JavaScript in your, you know, templates. So Mustache and handlebars, I should explain for the half of the people who didn't raise their hand. Um, they're just templating languages for HTML. So you can throw in some mustache tags, which are curly braces, and then a value will pop in there from your code somewhere so that you can kind of like lay out everything the way it should look for this little bit of HTML, but then put in values. Um, handlebars lets you define custom helpers, and what those are just the ability to have a name that does something like format a date. You say format date, then the name of the value, and then it will just format a date. And those turn out to be really helpful for writing your views and getting things going quickly. Um, transactions, so I'm kind of jumping back and forth between Ember and Ember data here, but transactions are part of Ember data. And it's the same thing that it sounds like from the database world. You have the notion of transactions that can be committed or rolled back um, in the client. So example of using that is you need to have let somebody edit a model in the browser, you start a transaction, they click cancel, you just roll back the transaction and the model gets reverted to its state from before. Or you could commit the transaction and it will then send that stuff to the API on your, your server. Um, those eliminate a lot of code once I realized you could use them. Um, and then this is something that Ember's work, Ember data are working more towards getting is the ability to support a nested API. So the notion of like where you have like slash posts, slash one, slash comments, you know, where your API is nested the same way that your data is nested. That's not something that's officially supported. And I realized I could use some hacks to make it work, but the better way was just to go back to a completely root-based API, which ended up being way easier in the end. So. That's, that's kind of the way Ember Data wants to work, and that's, that's definitely a theme, is to stick to the way it wants to work. Um, so how did I get to that point? Searched GitHub a lot. Um, I looked for Ember, Sprout Core, Handlebars, and actually those aren't you know, just silly. That Those are the two guys who make Ember, and their projects and GIS end up having a whole bunch of useful information in it, especially around the late 2012 timeframe. There was, there was basically nothing out there. And you know, their, their individual GitHub pages had things like um, just about what the new router API was going to look like, or somebody's experiment with the toy app to show how this new thing worked. And that was where I first started to get my toehold into the community so that I could actually start learning things. Because back then, it was, it was a very, not unwelcoming, it just wasn't a web presence for the community. They were in their private chat room, and you know, there, there wasn't really a discussion for them yet, although now there is. So I found these apps that are all Ember. The bottom three are just kind of toy things that you can, you know, those were around back in uh, late 2012. Uh, to do MVC was a really poor example of an Ember app, though, because it was built like Sprout Core, which is the precursor to Ember. But the top one there is the best one, which is Travis Next. Um, how many of you heard of Travis CI, or Continuous Integration? So Travis is like, it's a continuous integration service that runs, it's only for open source projects right now, they're, they're debating it for closed source stuff also. And it's front end that let, lets you look at your builds and see how your tests are passing and stuff is all written with Ember now. And back then they were writing it and it was being written in Ember and it was, they were going through the same growing pains because they were adopting it before APIs were solidified so it was good to see other people experiencing the same pain and kind of get to see how they were handling those problems. Then, near the end of October, um, I went out to San Francisco, and I was there because my girlfriend was running the San Francisco Marathon, and I just so happened to have tweeted Tom Dale at one point um, and sent him a message and said, hey, you know, do you want to meet up and talk about Ember, and let me show you this horrible Ember app I've made and see if you think it's cool. And so I met him and talked to him, and that's where things got a lot better. Um, 
I got inducted into their uh, cabal and was able to kind of talk to their group of people. And by what I mean by cabal is they have a campfire room that they talk in. So they don't really use IRC because if you have the core team members of a framework on IRC and one person in there says just like something like, oh yeah, here's how you fix that problem, 300 other people send messages at that person asking, you know, okay, how do I fix this now? And it's just not tenable. So when they need to discuss things internally, they have a small private chat room, and then they have community members that go out and answer questions in IRC and stuff. But that was really awesome to get let into that little private world. And that's kind of where my happiness with Ember really started to hit a spike of, you know, it was going very well. So November 2012, I got asked by uh, Little Lines to do a presentation about Ember called, uh, that I ended up calling Why Ember. And um, it's a technical presentation, and it's on GitHub, and it's built with Ember, and there's a bunch of slides there, and it's got live code samples. You write it in CoffeeScript, and you can even see the JavaScript. It was ambitious, but I ended up not spending a lot of time on the content. So it's kind of all over the board, and I haven't updated it for the new API. So some of it's still relevant, but that got me out there, which eventually got me my first client for Ember stuff. Um, and at the time, I wasn't working for Sparkbox. I was working for a horrible, unnamed government entity. So uh, I had a lot of free time in the evenings and was also not happy with the code I was doing at work. And that client was CrowdHall. Um, I heard some people here might know CrowdHall, but uh, they started out as a, what, what is it, the startup incubator thing down here? The, the Brandery, yeah, that's, that's what they started in and now they're out in a whole nother place. And they wanted to rewrite their Backbone app in Ember. Um, and their lead tech guy was like, you look like you know Ember. Do you want to pair in the evenings and kind of you know figure it out together and write some Ember code? I said cool, and it turned it out to be a great way to learn because you kind of it's the thing that is always tempting, at least for me, when I see new programming technology or like frameworks out there, is just to read and read and read, watch screencasts, go sign up for Peep Code, get a pro account on Railscast, and just learn everything, and then three days later, or weeks, as it usually is, you know, start writing code finally and realize I didn't retain any of that stuff. So this was a really great way to continue coding and keep learning. And so that's what I did was I paired with him and kept working on that. We'll get back to where that went later. So now January, um, I skipped December there because in December I got hired by Sparkbox and it was just a crazy month and there's holidays there too. Um, so January rolled around and how many of you have been to CodeMash? Okay. Um, how many of you were at CodeMash this year? Okay, cool. So at CodeMash, we showed up and uh, the internet was really horrible on day one because they hadn't even like flipped on whatever Cisco switch they had to do to make the internet work. And I was getting these horrible pains of like, you know, I can't even look at the schedule. And when I can, it's some sort of weird, uh, do I not install anybody? Uh, Microsoft stack like app that was built by some. I mean, you can build things that are good with Microsoft technology, I hear. So it's, yeah, there you go. Um, so it, it just, it was really hard to use. It had weird GUIDs in the URL that you had to, you know, like when you clicked a date and it just didn't work well and it was really bad on a bad network connection. I was like, you know, this is like the purpose of Ember and things like it, you know, do everything in the client. And when it's a small scope like this, Let's see if we can like spike out like a whole new app for you know Code Mash. And so, what we ended up making was Mashboard, and that was like 36 hours of coding. And I did sleep, um, but we had some designers there too from Sparkbox, and so they took it upon themselves to brand it. So before this, it looked way worse, um, but they did make it you know kind of cool and responsive and all that great stuff. But it was a great proof of concept to me to also that. You know, Ember works great for small projects like this. It works well for larger projects as well, uh, um, as well but you, you need a lot more experience going up to this. So it was great. Um, built this app, and we launched it, put it on Twitter. People started using it. It was wonderful. Uh, open sourced it uh, later on in the CodeMash week um, and put it on GitHub so that people could have it as an example of how to use Ember.js. So I wrote a timeline up of the development of um, Mashboard, and it's rather long, but it shows all the screenshots of stuff as it went along. And since we're in the middle of a timeline, you get the joke. Uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of a cool little thing that shows the progression of you know, like all the commits that led up to making this thing work. 
This is compliant with the newest version of Ember. So this code is like real legitimate, like it works. And it does a lot of weird custom things, like an adapter that talks to JSON generated by some .NET app that I didn't write. And I had to modify things to make it handle that. And how I cache things, and local storage, and some other buzzwords. So it's, it's a good thing to learn from. So they're great to learn from. And I think that's probably the way from now on, whenever I see a new framework, it's like, think of something cool to build and build it, um, and something small scope. You know, I, I mean, a lot of people have done that in the Ember community, and it's worked out well. Like, people have made a clone of Letterpress and Ember, Jeopardy and Ember. I mean, those are the good kind of projects to learn this with. If you start with a giant project or just reading, you're not going to get anywhere. So February, um, I kept coding more and more Ember stuff. Uh, I, we have a client for Sparkbox um, that I can't say the name of, but I made an app for them that's taken a few months to build. But it's an app for looking up um, things with addresses, apparently. Um, and it's got a map, that, which is from Mapbox. And the list on the right there is the list of stuff on the, on the left. Um, it is this, I'm showing this, though, because this is a large app written for a kind of enterprise-y client, and they're very happy with it. Um, it responds well on an iPad and iPhone, and it runs great. Uh, it, it was upgraded from their original Rails app, which uh, I rewrote in Backbone and then decided to put it in Ember a few weeks later, because it turned out they wanted about 100 more features. So uh, yeah, it, it was, it's a really good experience, and it's one of the first ones that I've done that was huge in scope, um, the amount of data that can be represented, pagination, and stuff like that. So it really proved to me that Ember, you know, finally ready for prime time, that I was able to do something for a client. So that was awesome. And then in February, I also went to Ember Camp. Um, that's the first annual uh, meetup of Ember developers, only like 100 people out in San Francisco. But that was also nice to see a bunch of different developers, hear them all have the similar problems. So that's another great way that I learned about Ember. Um, and then March, uh, which was, I think, last month, uh, yeah, it rolled around and we launched CrowdHall, the new version of CrowdHall. And it's all Ember.js, um, and it's been really great. They haven't had almost any problems with it, scaling it or anything like that. Um, and it's performant and works well all the way back to IE8. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been really good. And I'm actually going to give you a demo of it. So let's see if I can get out of this presentation without breaking things. So nope, it's actually down here. All right, so this is CrowdHall. And this is the newly rewritten version. I'm responsible for none of the way that this looks good and all of the way that it functions. Um, and so go into a hall here. And you'll see this is loading locally. And so I believe my server might actually have spun down. Oh, no, there it goes. Okay. So this is all Ember. Once again, see, we're doing kind of modals, all the trappings of a app, client side sorting there, back to the home page, go to another thing. It'll load its stuff, show it all. So you can see kind of the responsiveness you're getting there. Just what you would expect from any kind of client side MVC app. So yeah. That was really fun to do, and they're really liking it. Uh, the only thing they have a hard time right now is finding more Ember developers. So if any of you write Ember code or want to learn it and eventually get good at it, contact them, because I'm sure that they might have a job for you there. Um, it also has one interesting feature, which is it does lazy authentication. I think I've seen this a few places. But if you try to do something that requires authentication, it will actually spawn a login form or registration form. Complete the process however you'd like. It will close this window and complete the thing you tried to do originally, which is kind of fun to you know, experience. I enjoy that little feature. Um, it was a lot more work than it was. It was, it was fun, though. So yeah, that's, that's a demo of a live in the world Ember app that's running right now. Um, let's see, play. So Anyway, resources. So these are things that I used or would have used if I could have to learn Ember. This is the best one. Buy this right now if you're going to do Ember stuff ever. It's the thing to buy. It's peep code. I think it means it's $9, something like that. And it's absolutely the best introduction to Ember you could ever hope for. It's like an hour and a half long. And the code sample he gives demonstrates a lot of the functionality that you need to know to get started with Ember. Um, absolutely the best resource. Uh, next thing. Ember Guides, they have this guide section on the website on emberjs.com. And Tom just recently put up a 
screencast there of him building an app in about 30 minutes. It's not as good as the peep code, but it's still you know, functional and the code's out there to learn from. The guides have gotten a lot better uh, and they're being constantly updated with new stuff. It's a GitHub repo too, so you can go in and fix typos if those kind of things make you insane. Um, next up, API docs on the same site. Um, they're actually really good though. They're all generated automatically from their you know, source code using JS doc. And so you can see everything that you might have to browse the source code files otherwise on a website that's searchable. Um, as far as keeping up to date with Ember and what's happening, there's Ember Watch, which is a website that guy kind of aggregates everything um, that happens in the Ember community. Great place to go to learn everything about Ember um, or learn what's out there about Ember. And the Twitter account's how I keep up to date with that one. And then there's a discourse now. So how many people have heard of discourse? Jeff Atwood's new project, the guy who made Stack Overflow. Um, it's a new message board written in our new forum software written with uh, Ember.js and Rails in the back end. And they'd been working on that for about a year, so they were working closely with you know, the Ember community for a long time there. It's open source, and so it's easily the largest open source you know, app out there for Ember. And they don't use Ember data, but everything else in there is really great to learn from. They have a couple of really smart guys working on the project that, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting um, way to keep up with Ember. But yeah, anyway, there is actually an Ember discourse. And so discuss.emberjs.com is the message board for Ember, and there's, it's, it's working. There's a great community there, and it's easy to share stuff and see other stuff that people are doing. So big thumbs up to that. And then there is the Ember, Ember IRC, um, Ember.js on Freenode, if you're not terrified of uh, anonymous people on the internet. And it's great, and that actually is a screenshot from an Ember app written to kind of show the Ember IRC channel. It's, like I said, small toy apps, great way to learn it. And so that's what they did to make that awesome thing. So that's it. It's kind of a slapdash overview of how I learned Ember. Um, there are a lot of resources there. But I'm happy to answer a lot of questions, although it looks like tacos are here. So maybe we'll like taco break and then ask me a lot of questions. And I've got an appendix, too. So there's more, more slides if I need them. Let's just do like a few minutes of questions, and then we'll OK, cool. So the, the Travis.next thing, does that actually use Ember data? Uh, that's a good question. I think they. I don't know. I, I actually, it's funny that I can't remember if they do or not. It feels like they might not. But it, the thing is, is, it was a bad decision to use Ember data back in like August time frame, somewhere in there. Like, I mean, early, middle of 2012 was a bad idea because it was really in flux. And now it's starting to stabilize more. They're spending more time on it. They have dedicated developers working on it. And there's some other companies that are really bought into using it, like Yap. They're a huge user of Ember. They made, um, actually the company is a different name, but Yap is their product, which lets people make um, iPhone apps in the browser that run in the, on the iPhone through their little host app. And it's running Ember on the, on the website and on the phone. But they have some dudes there that are working on Ember data and like performance in general in Ember. So, yeah. But I so they're using Ember in mobile. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, they're the reason why Ember performs decently on mobile because they they had to fix the performance problems to be able to use it on mobile devices. So that was a big part of why it got faster somewhere back at the end of last year. If I were going to use uh, or make a new single page app to do something just new. I, I would absolutely use Ember for it, but I mean, I've been doing Ember for nine months, so you know, it is the technology that is most at my fingertips to use. Um, Backbone is good for certain purposes, and if I know that I have to do something that's of a definitely limited scope that needs to be very performant in some weird, arcane way, I might consider it, but really I'd use Ember because I've done it so much recently. It's, you know how it is. When you know a technology really well and you've been using it for all your projects, it's easy to keep doing it. But I think it's certainly a valid solution still. I would not use Angular or consider it because I find their documentation, you know, if Ember had bad documentation, they have something else. So I think one of the keys that I do is if you're if you're refactoring factoring a current app that exists that already has static views and you just want to add some interactivity, backbone is like perfect because you can throw it in there with minimal overhead and just kind of like refactor into it. Whereas Ember you kinda have to start from yeah, that's a good distinction to make, greenfield versus not. And I've heard that said a lot of times, that if you want to add islands of richness to your app, 
the way the base camp did. You know, you'll use backbone for a small portion of it. Um, it it's true that that's a good thing to do, and it makes it, it backbone lets you get closer to the metal if there is metal in JavaScript, meaning that like you're still able to talk to jQuery and do things. You can in Ember as well, but you don't have to as often. And so it's certainly a good entry point also for JavaScript developers who haven't done client-side MVC because you're, you're still using your same classes and you know, you're using your you know, custom class names to talk to different <laughs> buttons or you're embedding data attributes to do stuff. Like, it kind of makes sense. It's a good transition in that way too because if you're moving from a Rails app to a, a somewhat of a backbone app, you probably haven't done much JavaScript. And yeah, it's certainly a good use case. Anybody else? Have you used Ember data in production? Would you consider it like production worthy? I've used it in production and for a couple reasons. I have a direct line into the developer so I can say, is this actually broken or you know not? Um, I, I've used it enough that I feel comfortable with it because I've been using it since like last August. So I, I can work around its flaws if there are any and I know what its limitations are. So I know when I have to step outside of it. So I think I'm okay to use Ember data, but I wouldn't recommend people use it for something that is, I mean, it's good for something that's small in scope. So Ember, dra uh, Ember data, um, there's like, you know, dragons there because it's beta software still. And it's great for read-only apps. Um, for small data model apps and definitely for experienced users because if you have to get into the internals of Ember Data, you're really going to need to understand Ember because they use the Ember's paradigms inside of Ember Data. And you nested callbacks, you don't have to do those anymore. You still have to mess with those a lot when you're not using something like Ember Data, which is promise-based. Now, you could still use jQuery with promises and you, know, you could do all that stuff, but it's kind of baked into the framework for Ember Data. I'd say give it another month or two and Ember Data is going to be there, but you know, just like this year is going to be the year of desktop Linux, I don't know. So, yeah. Anyone else? Let's see tacos. Nice. Thanks. Thank you.